who you've never met. People can reveal their interests in ways that they didn't know others had shared interests. So every morning I wake up, I am astonished that I have 1.7 million followers on Twitter. I keep thinking to myself, should I remind them that I'm an astrophysicist? <laughs> the numbers are not supposed to be this large. And that tells me that there's a hunger out there expressed by people who never had an occasion to tell you that they cared about science or the universe. So that's one way it was cultivated. Um, what I'm describing are places in society that are islands of scientific uh, interest that I'd like to think Cosmos brings together in one statement. There are many documentaries on science that you can find. Hardly any back in 1980. You can channel surf and land on one. They're made differently from Cosmos, but you could learn about the search for life, the Big Bang, or you can, there are documentaries just on those topics. There are whole websites given to celebrating science. Whole Facebook pages that do this. Books are, of course, another aspect of this. And there is Seth McFarlane putting little snowflakes of science into his cartoon that has jokes about flatulence, okay? The fact is, the time is exactly right for Cosmos because there's not been an occasion to coordinate these fragments of people's interests. So we get someone who has media power, Seth. I had some internet influence. We have people who have worked in the public eye. Our director of photography for Cosmos, Bill Pope, directed was the director of photography for the Matrix trilogy and for Spider-Man. That means when he's filming me, he's not just setting up a camera on a tripod and having me talk to it. The camera becomes a character. What the camera does is part of the storytelling that goes on. So Cosmos is the summation of all these talents into one coherent product offered to the public. And the science is there, the creative arts is there, the visualization is there, the latest scientific data are represented there. We took you to the multiverse. We, had to, we showed bubbles, because we don't really know what it looks, who knows what the multi, we, <laughs> bubbles we showed you. But it's all there collected together. And uh, I don't know a better time to have done it than now. And this is the sum of everybody's talent. I should say we had a, we had a thousand people who have worked on the series, um, arguably the most complex television series ever made. And Neil's a New Yorker. I'm a New Yorker. Is Durian, who was the principal writer, executive producer, is a New Yorker. We based this in Los Angeles because we wanted access to people like Mr. Pope, who, who was a director of photography, visual effects were supervised by a fellow named Reiner Gombos, who won the Emmy last year for Game of Thrones. So here's a guy who comes to storytelling in a rich environment like Game of Thrones and now applies it to the science of Cosmos, it brings tremendous entertainment value which distinguishes us from any other science series. Uh, so uh, Cosmos uh, not only will share new science with the audience, uh, but that won't be what you remember most. As I said earlier, what you will remember most is how it threads the new science to a bigger story. In this first episode, we showed you the multiverse. That's a new idea that did not exist in 1980. We could have devoted an entire hour on just the multiverse. Then you'd know all about the multiverse. But that's not how we used that information. We used it as the continuation of the size and scale of the universe, where we are in that path and that just happens to be the last address of the cosmic uh, sequence of addresses from Earth, the solar system, the, the galaxy. So that's how we used that information. 
with exoplanets. There are now a thousand known planets orbiting other stars, all discovered since 1995. I gave a talk a couple of weeks ago to a group of students in college, and I realized they were all born after 1995. Just, just right at 1995 and after. And then I remember, well, that's when the first exoplanet was discovered. So then I called them Generation Exoplanet. <laughs> and so how do we think of exoplanets? We could spend time on each one, but then that would just be a science documentary. It wouldn't be cosmos. Cosmos is, if there are exoplanets, could there be life? Would that life look like us? Would it have DNA? We would connect it back to us so you can see where we fit in the big picture. Now, there are some people who are sure they've seen aliens or have been visited by extraterrestrials. They are sure. They will tell you with all of their passion. I'm not as convinced as others are for aliens. I'll be convinced if you drag the alien in, you know, into the middle of the square, okay? Better alive than dead, okay? <laughs> and then there's the alien, and then there's no fuzzy photographs. You don't need eyewitness testimony. You don't need any of the, the shaky evidence that has been put forth. There it is. That would transform biology, science, life. If they got here, they have better transportation capabilities than we do. One thing is sure. I, for one, will be embarrassed to tell the alien that we fight wars to gain access to energy. Buried underground, under your home. The alien would laugh at me if I told them that. Alien would slap its knee, if it had a knee, <laughs> slap its knee and say, that is truly backwards because the universe is full of energy. The universe is full of natural resources. And you're doing what to gain access to it? And I have to tell the alien, well, we have people on Earth who are only looking down at Earth because they think that's the where they need to solve their problems. And they're not thinking about space, the vastness of space, as a solution to anything. The alien would just get up and leave. They, they would not think we were intelligent enough to continue that conversation. And they would report back to their home that on Earth there was no sign of intelligent life. <laughs> I assume we've all seen the film. It's, uh, who has not seen Gravity? Right here in the front row. You go today, okay? You go, take her now to see Gravity. <laughs> um, I saw Gravity on the second day that it came out, and I felt compelled to send out some tweets about it, because I found some scientific errors in it. Uh, I, about 10 tweets I put out. The next day, people went ballistic. It was on the morning, my tweets were on the morning news, the afternoon news, the evening news, on the nighttime shows. And they all said, Tyson uh, uh, dislikes the Gravity movie. But no, it was the opposite. I really like the movie. I don't spend time criticizing the physics of Star Wars <laughs> or of Harry Potter. The movie has to rise to a level where I'm going to spend that kind of attention thinking about it and composing tweets about it. I could have composed another hundred tweets of what it got right, but I didn't. I picked out ten that I thought might be interesting. 
for people to notice. One of them, her hair never stood up on end in zero G. It was always just flat down. Everything else is floating. Her hair is just like, I thought maybe they could have worked on that one. Another one I wor worried about was Sandra Bullock is portraying a medical doctor and she's fixing my Hubble telescope. <laughs> no, okay? I don't walk into her operating table and say, excuse me, I will open up the person's chest. I'm an astrophysicist, no. So they were fun comments like that. Um, I finally had to come out with a statement saying I really liked the film. I would later remind myself that the director's me from Mexico, so congratulations on this. It has been nominated for so many Academy Awards. It's a very tough year though. A lot of very good films came out this year, but it will surely win some. And <clears throat> my point is when the tweets went up, other people joined in the fight. People had bar fights over the physics of the movie. And I said, wow, people are getting emotional about the science in a Hollywood movie. They're not arguing about who's in love or the, car, the chase scene. Or they were arguing about the physics. And I said, wow. That's a good, so I just sat back and just let all of that unfold. Uh, I think things are changing, even if only slowly they're changing. And movies like that are help to this. Oh, by the way, the catastrophic destruction of all Earth satellites, as described in that film, is a real scenario. Because one breaks, it makes 10 other parts, and each one t hits another satellite that makes 10 other pieces. So it rapidly becomes a, a, an ocean of debris that just wipes out all the satellites in the world. We don't want that to happen. Yes. Sí, que Antonio.